it's Sunday morning, February 28th. We are, you are listening to the Women Who Make Us Wine Radio and TV show. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, creator of Incandescent Radio and TV, here with my co-host Jim Morris, the Napa Valley Wine Guy, and our guest today, the amazing Anna Keller. So Anna Keller, Keller Estate Wines, and Jim, you and Anna have been friends for a long time, so I'm really excited to hear more about her life, the wine industry, and of course, her beloved Keller Estate Wine. So I'm going to throw it over to you. Well, thank you, Hope, and, and welcome, Anna. It's, <laughs> you were very high on my, my initial list when Hope asked me to put together you know, the top people. It's like you were very high up there because, because I, not only do I love your wines, but I admire who you are and what you've done because uh, I used to be involved with a, another Pinot um, uh, winery, McPhail Wines, and loved the whole area of the, the Petaluma Gap. That's when I first met you. And you were such a driving force behind the creation of Petaluma Gap and then the winery that you have. So it's like, I, you just have such a cool story and, and an amazing estate. And I wanted to focus on, on that. And, and you have killer horticultural skills. So <laughs> we wanna, we're going to touch on that as well. So uh, uh, Anna, welcome to, welcome to my little podcast here with Hope. I'm excited to be joining you this Sunday morning. Where, where else would I want to be on a Sunday morning than chatting with two good friends? So, well, thank you. We feel it's, it's like such a, this is a conversational show. I didn't want to have like a lot of scripted stuff um, because it does just feel like, you know, wine is such a, you know, social beverage and it's something that we enjoy a lot and, and it's, it should be enjoyed with friends. And so, and we'll have the shameless commerce part of this after where I'll just say, please go visit Anna at her place. But, um, but get, just go in a little bit about your journey in wine and how you really started, uh, started, you know, the, the, the seminal moment where it's like, I want to be in the wine business. It's funny that you would ask that because when I kind of was getting prepared for today and I had a list of potential questions or areas that you want to cover and I thought, what are the most, you know, that wine that made a ha for me or that made me want to go into the wine business and I don't think it was really a wine. I'm not, I am not that kind of person that tells you it was exactly this wine, this vintage and the flavor profile of the wine was so, I, I always know who I was with, what, what, what I was eating and if the conversation was good or not. So I'm, I'm more, I'm that kind of a wine person. I, I enjoy everything that wine brings together. So, you know, I started, I started, I never thought I'd be in the wine business. When I was, I was a student of biochemistry and I was studying in London, my master's degree, which should have turned into a PhD and it didn't, thankfully. And my now husband decided that we should take a wine appreciation course. And so for the next 12 weeks, we took a wine appreciation course in, in London. And it was great because this is back in the early 90s. And London, if you wanted to taste wines from all around the world, that was a great place to be. You, we would get wines from South Africa and from not a lot from the US, but from France, from Italy, from, from Australia. And so I really got a kind of we just enjoyed it. And even now, my husband's a much better taster than I am. But that was sort of my first exposition to, oh, people actually work in the wine industry. Wine is not just something that magically appears on our table. Um, but fast forward to that, I eventually, my dad had planted a vineyard in Petaluma and he planted the Chardonnay. Back in the 1990s, the person that was doing, you know, one of the people that was putting Chardonnay on the map was Rombauer. And we were very lucky that Rombauer back then kept growing and they just couldn't find any more Carnero Chardonnay. So they kept going further west and further west until somebody told them, well, these, there's this family out on Petaluma. They planted Chardonnay. Heaven knows is it, if it's good, but you're desperate. So why don't you give them a call? So we got a call and uh, you know they needed, the, they needed the fruit. The first year I wasn't involved. My dad just solely sold the fruit and little by little, two year three, year four, you know, they kept coming by to buy grapes. And one year my dad said, well, this year I want to keep one ton of fruit for myself and, and have a, you know, 60 cases of Chardonnay. I don't think the man knew what 60 cases of Chardonnay is in an entire <laughs> year, but, and when he did that, they called him back. It was probably early February. And they said, you know, you've got, we've got stuck fermentation. You've got to, you know, you've got to come and tell us how you want to resolve this stuck fermentation. And that's where I came in. He, he said, look, you're kind of in, towards the end of your PhD. Do you know what you're doing? 
Um, are you really into this? Or would you mind going to Napa and looking, looking at this problem? So I went, to, I went to Rombauer and I fell in love with wine. It just had everything I wanted. There was the outdoors, there was the plants that I love, there was biochemistry um, and there was wine. And so I got involved, it turned out it wasn't that difficult to unst unstick that fermentation. And I got hooked on that era ever since. I love the Rombauer connection. I had no, I, I did not know that story. So it's funny because it was really, I, my guess is that at some point we were about 15 to 20% of that early nineties Rombauer Chardonnay. I always like to say we were the acid in their Chardonnay. Yeah. And <laughs> one, one thing, and I, I'm going to, we're going to get a little geeky just because I love the geekiness, especially of Pinot. Um, and it, 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 the Petaluma Gap really is a special part of of you know the the Pinot Noir world, and it's uh, when I worked at McPhail, the we were sourcing from uh, Gap Crown and some of some of your neighbors, and it's like it it is a it's such a unique place. People think about Sonoma County and Russian River Valley and Sonoma Coast as being the premier uh, Pinot uh, growing areas, but Petaluma Gap is one of those special places that is it's unique it's fascinating and um can you tell just tell people a little bit what makes petaluma gap such an amazing place for pinot well what makes it an amazing place for pinot is probably the wind tunnel that is created so out by the coast where bodega bay is and you get great oysters the mountain range instead of running parallel to the coast runs perpendicular to the coast so it allows actually the wind to come the wind and the fog to come in from the coast or from the ocean and it comes straight into Petaluma and then it hits another mountain range. So it kind of takes a, takes a right turn and heads all the way out to the San Pablo Bay that feeds into the San Francisco Bay. So this really creates a wind tunnel and that wind cools the vines every afternoon. It's almost like clockwork. Two o'clock hits and we start getting wind, it picks up and by 7 p.m. the wind starts dying down but it really does cool the, the grapes in the afternoon during the summer. And what that does, it changes, it makes it a very cool growing area. And coolness is good because it allows for the grapes to mature very slowly. And so the flavors develop a little bit more. And also you get really nice, bright acidity in the wines. And for all of those, for those of us who like to eat and drink wine, acid is great. It just keeps the wines fresh. It cleanses the palate. And it actually also gives the wines a lot of uh, longevity. Um, the P oh God, what am I trying to say? Pinot Noir is such a beautiful, I mean, it, it, it tastes like where it's from. Um, if you try Pinots from, uh, from Burgundy or Pinots from Anderson Valley or Russian River or, and it, or even further south in, in uh, Santa Rita Hills, it really does, it reflects where it's grown. What, what do you think stands out most about uh, Pinot from Petaluma Gap? Well, the other thing that I failed to mention about, about the Petaluma Gap is that this wind is beating on the skins of the grapes since the grapes kind of start their life. And so the skins get thicker and thicker with that wind. I always kind of try to make the, the relationship with, with a, you know, a sailor's skin that they're so exposed to the wind all the time in their life that their skin really thickens. And the same thing happens to the grapes. And as we may or may not know, a lot of the flavors, tannins, phenols, and flavor is in the skins. So this really allows this, the, the, the Petaluma Gap Pinot Noirs to be very flavorful, concentration of fruit, but also because it's such a cool region, you can pick the, the, the Pinot at very different sugar levels. And this allows you to have very big, bold, Pinot Noirs, or you could have lighter style Pinot Noirs. And so I think that's what's fascinating. Then that's why so many winemakers, you know, ever since the 90s have gravitated to the Petaluma Gap to buy fruit from it. Did that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Hope you have a question. I do. And I want to talk to, I love this insider view of what the wine industry looks like, because, you know, people like me, um, you know, wine is is something that's on the shelves and for most of us. So what, tell us the process of, you know, how does it go from planting to harvesting to bottling to marketing? Slowly. Boy, how, long, how long do you have? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, you know, I think one of the things that it really is, you know, one of the things that always surprises me, and I always have to take a moment, um, whenever I start showing a new wine, I look at the label, I'm like, okay, you're 2018. And then I have to go back in time and remember what 2018 looked like. Because really, wine is, shows you the passage of time. What were the conditions of the weather? Did it rain that year? Um, was it a cool year? Did we have any heat spikes? So really growing the grapes, and we only make wines from the fruit that we grow on our property. That was our, our mission from day one. So for me, it really is the passage of time through the vines that we, that we farm. And so it takes, you know, it just, wine does take you back to those conditions. And there's nothing you can change about the weather. Uh, all you can do once you get a new harvest is, is really just ensure that the wines can shine and show what was most relevant or, you know, maybe you, you try to correct here and there things that, that nature didn't give you as, as pristine. But it is, you know, the beautiful, once somebody told me that the only industry that had it harder than the winemaking community were film directors. And, you know, a film, a film director may have eight, 10 movies in their lifetime. You know, that's a big accomplishment for them. And I think that as winemakers or wineries, we may have 25, 30 harvests under our belt. So you only get 30 chances to make certain very critical decisions along the line. Mm -hmm. And that I think is something that's very unique to the, to the wine business. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So you plant the grapes, you harvest the grapes. I mean, you, t t well, let's, let's talk a little bit about those catastrophic fires you guys had this year. Tell us how that's made an impact on your business. Uh, well, you know, it, it really, it really took us by surprise to be quite honest. We are in a very open area, the, the Petaluma Gap, because of these winds, we don't tend to be high forest areas, areas. So we are not an immediate threat of actual fires but the Petaluma Gap winds this year really didn't play to our benefit. And there were some fires out by Bodega Bay. So all of that smoke was funneled through that beautiful Petaluma Gap right into you know, a lot of Sonoma County, especially the Southern tip of Sonoma County, which is the Petaluma Gap. We unfortunately lost, um, most of our Pinot Noir was smoke tainted, like most people. We're, we're in the process of figuring out and then if, if the word pivot was relevant at any point, yeah, this year was especially relevant. So we've, we've been making a couple of projects. We made a lot of rosé. Um, it came out beautiful. It's, it's actually, it was the, the redeeming quality. It was beautiful fruit that became rosé. And so it was, it was hard. We, we learned a lot. I, uh, I don't think I'd like to relieve that. But on the positive note, my brother's a, um, a professor of environmental sciences down in Santa Barbara. And we've been talking, and one of the things that we're trying to launch is a really comprehensive study about the different smoke taint com chemical components in wine. And they're, they're naturally in the grapes. And I think it is, there's not enough studies, but I think it is time that there's a really good study to let us know what are the base levels that every wine has in non-smoke years so that when you do get smoky years, you know if you're above or below that threshold. So it is a little bit, I, I do go back to my chemistry roots once, you know, here and there. So that's always a lot of fun and it's a new learning opportunity. Yeah, it, the, the person that does identify how to remove that, uh, that smoke element uh, it, uh, chemically without affecting the flavors of the grape will be a multi-billionaire uh, because it is a challenge and it seems to be a, a bigger challenge and, and we'll, in, you know, year after year, it seems to get worse and worse. Um, one of the, and I'm gonna pivot a little bit here. Uh, one of the things when, when Hope first talked with me about starting this podcast, one of the things that, uh, the perspectives that she brought to it is that she, her business really focuses on women in business and the challenges women have experienced and and I've been in the wine business about 20 plus years now. And one of the things that I early on noticed that it was like a very male dominated business, even 20 years ago, it just seems, it seems forever ago, but, but it, it has changed, the, the landscape is changing rapidly. But I'm really curious on, from your perspective, from, it, it's like, the, so what are some of the challenges that you faced as, a woman starting in the business and you know was it positive was it not was it um you know it, it, it's that journey that also fascinates me you know, in trying to showcase 
how far we've changed and we, how far we still need to change. Well, I started in the business when I was 27. And um, so I don't, I sometimes sit back and it's like, was it the, the, my youth or the fact that I was a female that was harder? Uh, you know, cause I was also tasked from day one to start a winery. So I didn't get the benefit of one internship, another internship, and I didn't, I, it was just like, okay, here you go, start a business. So that was, that was a little bit challenging. I had a great mentor, which was my dad. My dad is a very successful businessman. He's also a very demanding businessman. And he's somebody who just, you know, he, he's never really, I, I would say for him, gender was not an issue. One of my earliest memories was I, I had a, you know, I have three boys and they were all small and I had to travel and I wasn't with them. And the complications of all of that, and I just was, I broke down and he said, well, just think the, think of the example that your boys have. Think of what they're looking at, what kind of a woman they're looking at. And, and for me, that became sort of every time that I've doubted or I've been worried about decisions that I'm making, I think, okay, what example are my boys looking at? And for me, that, that was really kind of one of the things that constantly was able to, to guide me and, and kind of give me a more, you know, a little bit of peace as I was making decisions. But early on, I, I do, I, I was, I was, I was really, you know, I, I, I was thinking today that one of the things that the hardest thing when you're starting is you, you don't want to ask stupid questions, but because you, you don't, and especially as a female in the business, so male dominated. And also, you know, by the time you're asking quite early on, you're asking questions to people who have a lot more experience than you do. And you don't want to sound stupid, but now I've come to realize the sooner you ask the questions, the sooner you'll stop being stupid. Um, but I think that that first step is always, uh, always a bit of a challenge. Yeah, it's, this was a lesson I learned really early on. It's like, I, there were times that I, as a young man, I would come up to wine country and I was just intimidated by it. It was really a difficult, it, it's difficult enough to figure out what wines you like, but but then to come to a winery and I, I kind of was made to feel stupid at some of the places I, that I tasted at. I say, like, oh, what do you mean you don't know the difference between Pinot and Cabernet? It's like, well, I'm 23 years old. I didn't, <laughs> um, you know, I was just here with my buddies. And so, you know, there's so many different barriers that have to be broken down. And my mission early on was just like to break down the pretension of learning about wine and, in a respectful way and knowing that everybody doesn't know everything. It's, it's, it's a very complex business. Um, that's why I even break it down. Like there are only two wines made in the world. There's yummy and yucky. So let's, <laughs> just, let's just keep it that simple. Um, and one of the, it, one thing that I would just say, and I, I've been to a number of events at your winery and you're one of the most gracious hosts, hosts anywhere. Um, from that, how do you talk about how you make your wine club members and your customers feel as welcome as you do and, and how important that is to our business? Well, you know what, I, I've always thought that uh, in this business, early on when I started, loyalty and, and accounts were very loyal. People who bought your wine, they liked your wine, they supported your wine. And the more we've, the world has grown and become more globalized, the more options people have. So loyalty becomes scarcer and scarcer. And for me, our wine club members are our most loyal and supportive um, group of, of buyers and, and they're, they become friends. I, unfortunately, one of the best things that happened to me during the COVID times is understanding that Zoom was allowing me to reach to people that I normally didn't have a chance to touch as much as the people that come to the winery, the club members that come to the winery. So I, I always like to, you know, I do my, I, it doesn't, I, I like people, I like parties, I like to host. It's something that, you know, I have big Latino family. So Sunday lunches regularly are 10 to 12 people. So if we go from 10 to hundred people, for me, it doesn't kind of phase me too much. Um, so I just really like to make people feel welcome. And as you were saying, just, their appreciation for what I do is is what keeps me going, and, and the fact that they like a bottle of wine and they share it for an anniversary or a birthday, um, it always that's what keeps it interesting for me. And I always yesterday I had the best experience. I had this lovely young woman who had this gorgeous purse, and I didn't care if she liked the wines or not. I want to know where she got that purse. 
And then that's what that was what brought us together. And she very graciously showed me the purse. And and so you never know where a relationship is going to start. It could start with a purse, or it could start with flowers. Exactly. <laughs> what a great tie-in. No. Uh, I'm a, no, in fact, I, I'm going to, I'll let you tell the story because it is, it's a very good <laughs> story. Um, the, well, so, uh, I, I, you could, you could head it off. You could start it. <laughs> off, yeah. Uh, uh, Anna and I share a very close friend, a um, woman named Elizabeth Schneider, who uh, runs Wine for Normal People. And she's one of the strongest advocates. She will also be a future guest on the, on my little podcast. I get to interview her, which is I know it's funny. I've been on five of her podcasts throughout my career. She, there's like, uh, and they're all archived on it. And it's funny to just listen to where I was at that time talking about it. But, but Elizabeth's always been this advocate for just normal, normalizing wine. And uh, so she has this thing called underground wine events that we, um, that Anna and I were back in Washington, DC doing this, uh, the show, this event together. And it was so, it was such a fun thing, but the flowers weren't out and there was a whole kitchen full of flowers. So Anna and I were in the back of the kitchen making flowers. I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> well, I, well, you know what? One of the things that I love is I love getting my hands dirty and I, I love being a winery owner that's doing things. And that I think that's coming a little bit back to I like, you know, when we host something, it's something that means to me and I don't like it to be kind of a, a institutional winery. I, it really is my family's winery and I like to just transmit that. And so when we got to that event and there was all these flowers and there was a lot of other things to get organized and we, you know, Jim and I were ready. We, we didn't have anything to do. So we just both, you know, rolled up our sleeves and started to doing really, we do need to take a flower class together, but we did the best we could. And it really, you know, we got a chance to to thank under wine, underground wine events for everything they do for wineries. And I have to say that was probably one of the most rewarding wine events I've had in my life. Um, the way she handled it, the way the people that are so into wine, but not the snobbiness of wine. It was great to have people come up and talk to us. And it really just, I think that was the beginning of our flower friendship. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And hence the tributes that we, we were exactly, paying today. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I'm now, now we're going to get into the wine side of things because I, I, I have a couple of, I, I drank most of the ones that I got last time. But, <laughs> but I still have a bottle of the Rosé and the El Coro. And just to tell us a little bit about your, the, your wine, uh, the wine styles that you make at Keller Estate and, um, you know, what we would expect in a beautiful bottle from. Uh, from so the as I said, we only make wines from the fruit that we grow on our property. And so what, you know, we did experiment early on, we planted Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Syrah, and that those were basically the, the three great varietals that we aspire to make every year. Um, I like to make wines that are balanced, food friendly, and uh, as my dad liked to say, make them with as le least alcohol as you can so I can drink as much as I want. <laughs> so that's always something that I'm very cautious of trying to make sure that the wines are a little bit le more restrained. I would say that one of the things that I aim is for wines that are balanced and don't overpower the senses. I think that Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, the beautiful thing that they have is that subtlety of flavors and aromas. We only we are we are sustainably certified, but more than that, I'm always looking for new techniques on better farming. Now, for me, great great wine starts in the vineyard, so we don't use any pesticides. We don't uh, we have 300 sheep that are grazing and fertilizing the vineyard as we speak. As soon as we get bud break, which is when the plant actually starts showing little leaves, we'll have to move the 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 sheep out of the vineyard. But we're always aiming to make sure that the wine gets made in the vineyard. So you were asking me, Hope, a little bit before, how does that story do happen? And, you know, I always go back to the same vineyard. And that is the luxury that we have, meaning that at any given point, any day, I know exactly how all the vineyard is doing. And we get to know where the harder spots in the vineyard are. There's always, you know, there's always areas of the vineyard that are naturally better 
uh, they have better drainage, they have better access to sunlight, they're a little bit more protected. And so those already, you know, you've got all this combination of elements that nature gives you. And when we take that to the winery, I am aiming to make wines that are distinct between each other. So in the case of the Chardonnays, we do two very different Chardonnay styles. We do a very bright, crisp, mineral-driven Chardonnay, which is our Oro de Plata, which is kind of bright and mineral and crisp and great with oysters. And then we do our barrel-fermented Chardonnay, our Le Cru Chardonnay, which is a bit softer, a little bit more tropical fruits, a little bit rounder. I always call the Le Cru Chardonnay my Friday afternoon wine. I, I, th I say it's like comfort in a bottle because it just has that nice softness to it. And you really don't need anything in a on a Friday afternoon except a glass of wine. And then when we come to the Pinots, it is a little bit different because Pinot, as Jim said, is very, you know, you, you can see where it was grown. And for me, finally, I don't, I never, one of my goals is never to confuse our consumer. I want it to be really crisp and clear what they like and what they want to enjoy in their glass. So we make two Pinot Noirs. We make one from the fruit on the bottom portion of a vineyard, which is our La Cruz vineyard. And keep in mind that this region, the Petaluma Gap, has really heavy clay soils. We, are, we sit at the seabeds of the, the San Pablo Bay. And those heavy clay soils, they're very difficult to farm, but they also give really beautiful, uh, spicy, you know, kind of earthy Pinot Noirs. So the La Cruz Pinot Noir has all of that fruit forward, um, spicy. It always feels like this perfect wine, you know, for, for duck and it's just beautiful with some, you know, cherries. And I, I just, it's a really nice round soft Pinot Noir. Whereas El Coro Pinot Noir is, sits at the ridge top of our property. And that ridge top is even more exposed to the Petaluma Gap winds. So whereas the one that grows on the bottom portion is a little bit more protected, the one that sits at the ridge top is very, it, the, the wind is beating on that fruit every day. And so the concentration of flavors is even stronger. And, um, and you just get really earthy wines, wines that open up beautifully. And you just want to keep that, you know, that wine in the glass for as long as you can. That's so I'm cool. holding, so interesting. I'm holding, holding up, up the point. wines. Yeah. <laughs> so show us, show us all the ones you have. So that's the, the Pinot. That uh, is the I, Pinot, is and the as you can see, if, if Jim keeps that right there, I can explain a little bit our family's crest. So I was born and raised in Mexico City. My great grandparents emigrated from Switzerland to Mexico and then to the U.S. So that is right there is the coat of arms of our family, which Keller in German means cellar. So it was a very appropriate name for us to call our winery Keller. And it's got the Swiss flag, so you see the red and the white. And inside the white, you can see the key, which is the cellar master's key. So it does all tie in a little bit to the story of the family. Thank That's you, Jim. That was great. Thank you. Oh, I, <laughs> no, I, I, that was on my list of questions to ask. Was about the because who doesn't love a good family crest? And <laughs> I, well, I you know most... what it is. It's the, the only funny. So I'll tell you a good story. My sister Grace is an artist, and she doesn't like very conservative things. Let me put it that way. And our label is pretty conservative. So when my dad was going to turn 75, she said, uh, we, we came to this agreement that she would do a beautiful, a beautiful fun label and I would make the wine for that. And the only wine I had available at that point was our rosé. So she made the label and I made the wine. Exactly. So you've got it right there. So that is one of her watercolors. And now you can see that we've moved up to eight. My dad is 88. He'll be 89 this year. So we just bought all the 89th vintage of our rosé of Pinot Noir, but that, that still is his gift. So we did have to, um, that was kind of my way of making sure that I, I brought all of the family in together in the wine business. That's so fabulous. You know, what I love most about what you're talking about is it feels like not just family and story, but so creative that you can take this beautiful farming opportunity, right? Because I'm always amazed that when I meet the winery owners that they're basically farmers, right? You're vulnerable to the elements and yet you've taken this and made it into a family affair. Talk a little bit more about your family and how everyone participates in the, in the winery. Well, yeah, I, I, they, they all drink a lot of wine, which is a good way to start. <laughs> um, I'm actually the only one involved on the day-to-day -day business. 
my one of my nieces is actually a marketing student and she has been helping me and she she is getting a little bit the luxury of starting with internships so that's been great and she's a great photographer so i've you know we've integrated people in different ways my my sister is, is an artist so we have a lot of artists in the family and and everybody contributes in different ways my dad is still very much um I guess the guiding the guiding force behind making sure that we're always looking to have a viable business, that we're making decisions that years from now will still be relevant and will keep the family in business. Talk a little bit about the business of the wine business. So I said I told you, you know, I, I wanted to hold up a bottle too today, and I'm here in New Mexico. You guys are, of course, in California, um, but I they don't have it in New Mexico. They don't carry Keller Estate wine. So talk a little bit about distribution, how it works to get your wines across the country, how hard or easy that might be. Well, we are a small winery, and when I say small, we produce less than four thousand cases of wine every year, and that is very small for a distributor to really have the ability to focus and carry our wines. We could go on and on about what the distribution of alcohol is, but I don't think it's the what we want to talk about today. But we've, we've sort of turned and looked for advocates, people like Elizabeth Schneider, um, different people that can help us share the wine. We go, we invite people to come out. When travel allows, I go out and show the wines on the road, but we mainly sell to directly to consumers. So the best way to find our wines is on our website at uh, kellerestate.com. And there you're able to really join our wine club, uh, buy some, some bottles to get familiar with it. And, and you know nowadays, one of the things that we're starting to do, which is uh, things that we learned is, I really feel that wine and Zoom do go well together. Because if you have a conversation and you've got some wine, you don't need to stay for you know, you don't, you can still keep your life. You can listen to me on the side while you're doing dinner. And we can talk about how I made a wine coming up. We're going to be have doing a vertical of roti and roti is a wine that we make that's based out of Syrah and Syrah in, you know, it's completely different to Pinot Noir. Syrah really is very different depending on where you grow it. And so our, our Syrah in this very cool climate, is not the same as a Syrah that you would get from a warmer country or like Australia or New Zealand or South Africa. So our, our roti is actually a tribute to wines made in the northern tip of the Rhone in the Côte de Roti region, where they actually co-ferment Syrah, which is a red varietal with Viognier, which is a white varietal. And uh, out of these two comes a wine that has sort of different attributes. It's got that beautiful red tobacco, Kind of a, for me, that's our biggest wine. It's our kind of our, I always call it our steak wine, but it also have that something very delicate that that white Viognier gives the wine. And it also kind of just makes it a little bit longer. So we are going to be tasting through three different vintages because as I said, it really is every year was a different one, a, a different year. And you just, you know, when you chased it, and, and in my case, I am not the day-to-day -day winemaker. We've always had a winemaker behind um, behind, you know, next to me making the wine, but I can taste the winemaker. I'm like, oh yeah, this is, this is Michael's wine. You know, this is Alex's wine. This is Julian's wine. And so that's also part of the relationships that you build. I think we're a small community. There, there's a handful, well, a couple of handfuls of people that make Pinot Noir from Sonoma. So we all get together. We know each other. Many times we've shared spaces showing wines. I think one of the my original career would have been pharmaceutical industry. And that's a very selfish industry. You don't, you don't divulge your secrets. You don't talk to people about how you're doing things. And the wine industry, it's fascinating because you can have wine, wine, five winemakers and you're gonna hear them talk about their trade secrets and how they did things. And they don't, there's no threat because at the end of the day, it's such a combination of artistry and chemistry and what you got your hands on, you know, what fruit you were able to acquire that you can share secrets and it's still going to make the wines different. We still sell fruit and sometimes we'll taste the wines from three different winemakers that bought fruit from the same, the same vineyard. They picked the same day and their wines are completely different. And for me, that is really something that's fascinating about the, the other side of the business, which is growing grapes and selling grapes. In fact, your current winemaker, Julian, I, I got to know him when he was at Costa Brown, and he, he really was a truly gifted winemaker, and he, he, he worked with some of the greatest vineyards, uh, you know, in the, in, in probably in the world from the Pinot side of things, but he just coaxed out some 
really amazing flavors. And I, it's a, you're, you're blessed to have somebody of his caliber uh, as making your wines. It's, it's, it, it really is. Um, it, we, I'm trying to think, it's just from a, from a personal standpoint, from, you know, what, are there things that you still want to do that you haven't done yet? And what? what what's so? What's next? Well, I want to get water. I want to get water. So my my current, you know, I, I my my, I did not know I wanted to participate in getting an ABA. That was just something that naturally happened in the sense the elements were there, the need was there, but it wasn't something personal. But we don't have water on our property. We have three ponds, and if it rains, great. If not, we don't have water. And that is what currently keeps me awake at night. And then this year, there's, you know, there's really no water. Right now, everything is getting very dry. However, I'm six miles away from a recycling water treatment plant. And so my current obsession is I am down to hopefully by this year, we'll be able to get water, recycled water to supplement our ponds. And so that that's one of the things that that is right now on the top of my list of, of, of things that I need to get done. Do you truck it in or do you have to truck? No, water? actually, thankfully, there's a, the last pumping station is about a mile away from us. So we're going to okay. be trenching about a mile of pipes just so that we can bring that water to us. But um, it's a big challenge. Uh, and things that I've learned, you know, recycled water has its chemistry. So we have to make sure that it's the chemistry that we want for grapes. Um, but but it is. It's So that's one of my, and, and for me, that's kind of a, you know, we were talking, that's an estate challenge. That is a challenge that if I get that, mm -hmm. I can set the, our, our company for the next 50 years the right way. If I can't get water to this property, we might as well pull out the vines. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's, uh, what I love about the wine business is the family owned side of things. It's like, there's way too many corporate owned um, uh, wineries that, you know, and, and frankly, generationals, generations, General, gener, generationally speaking, um, most wineries make it to the second generation and then they sell because the family, the next generation doesn't have that passion or whatever. Um, from a, you know, your second generation now, at Keller State, what's the plans as far as moving it forward to multi, multi generation? Well, you know, I, I, that's, that also, that is important for me. And, and my kids are a little too young right now. And I did start them the wrong way. Uh, apparently making your kids work the bottling line is not what you want to do if you want them to be in the business. The bottling line is one of those jobs that's repetitive and, and tiring because you're on your feet all day and you're hearing this noise. It just makes you, you want to make you study something completely different. So now that I know, um, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> It, that I should have changed that part, but I we are looking at ways to make sure that there is something. There's so many facets to the wine industry. There's the hospitality side. There's the production side, the, and so I I'm just trying to make sure that they all know. But whether it's my kids or my my nephews, my nieces, the different areas that we need, so when they get a chance, they can actually you know start and step in. But it hopefully you know I. I've been in the business a little over 20 years too, um, almost half of my life. And I still hope to work here for a few more years and give them a chance to, to start up. Yeah, it's it, it really is fun to see the next generation and things like that, that come into it. And, and trust me, your boys will be, they'll be back. They will, they'll get to that point where it's like, your family owns a winery? Dude, you gotta go in that one, you gotta have to go in the business. <laughs> I think there. it is. It is. It is a fun business, and, and you know, it's obviously growing up here. They know a lot of families that are in the business, and if they're not directly in the business, they're in the restaurant business. And we're, you know, we are about tourism in Sonoma County too. So if we have visitors, so so it is. I think they'll they'll be back. And I I so I didn't really get a chance to start in the wine industry away from, you know, I I started on our family project, so I didn't get the the virtue of starting somewhere else and then deciding to join the family. So whenever I talk to, to young, young people, young women about how to get into their own family business, I always, I'm always like, go out, go do something completely different, go into the wine business, go work for somebody else, 
make messes somewhere else, learn the value of yourself, learn the value of your work, and make sure that when you go back into the, your family's business, you, you bring something new. And that way you'll feel more, you'll, you'll be relevant and your family will also see a different side. It might ruffle a few feathers because, you know, in, in this business, how many, I've heard so many times when I visited wineries in France, it's like, oh no, this is how my father does the wine and it does not change. We buy these barrels and these barrels only. So I know that it is part of like the, the youth and the energy of the younger generation is to ruffle feathers. And so you just, as, as somebody coming into the business, whether it's family in any area, you just have to be aware that you're gonna ruffle feathers. Well, um, and, and, and I love that sentiment. That it really is, you know, we have to rely on the next generation to carry it on and do it in their way and their style. And hopefully we've given them the tools to do that. And um, you know, and make good decisions and things like that. Um, I, uh, because I'm in the wine business and I deeply appreciate the, the struggle and challenge it is to sell wine. I'm, this is the shameless commerce part of our show that it's like, how do people get a hold of your wine? It, it's like, it, it's really beautiful wine. There's not a, there's not one. The reason I don't have any Sorala is because I drank it all. And it, it's really and a problem gonna, that we can fix. I know. I, I'm going to do your your uh, virtual class with the three rotis. I absolutely. I'm signing up for it after we're done here. So uh, it just looks well, so Well, you cool. can obviously. I, I think you know. I we you can always visit us in person or online, and so we have our website KellerEstate.com. And I always have, tell people if you're not quite sure, we try to be as descriptive as we can of the different wines. But you can always, there's a little thing that says contact us. And it's always, you know, if, if you just don't know, um, give us a ring, send, shoot us an email or try out a couple of wines. I think we don't make any bad wine. So you won't go wrong if you try something and it's a little bit out of what you normally do. Uh, or, and so I would really encourage people. I think I can't, I can't underscore how important it is for small wineries to receive visitors online. Um, we're, we're that's you guys are what makes it we make it to the next vintage buy honest wines that's all i could say <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it and you know we're so happy to have you I, I consider you one of the queens in the wine industry the way jim describes you and just keller estate has such a great reputation so kellerestate.com is where you can go check out anna and all of her beautiful work and we look forward to keeping the conversation going and maybe doing a virtual wine tasting through our women who make us wine show with your with your wines and our and our viewers and followers so thank you so much for your time today anna we really appreciate it Thank you. I, I enjoyed my Sunday morning. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yep. Brunch on Sundays every other weekend with Jim Morris, the Napa Valley Wine Guy. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs. You are listening to Women Make Us Wine. To listen to all of our podcasts, and you can also check them out on YouTube, go to womenwhomakeuswine.com. So thank you. Have a beautiful Sunday, and we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm.